What's up, you beautiful bastard? Hope you've had a fantastic Wednesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show. Buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. The first thing we're gonna talk about today is this, of course it is, confusing news around Kanye West. You know, as we talked about almost two weeks ago, whether you believe that he was really doing it or he was just trying to get attention, Kanye announced or claimed that he was running for president. And now, the news we're seeing today is confusing. We saw a number of reports coming out that Kanye West is dropping out of the 2020 election. You know, there were already conversations around the fact that he missed important deadlines a number of states to actually even get on the ballot as an independent candidate. But according to a report from Vanity Fair, Steve Kramer, who's a get out the vote specialist, said that he was hired by West to get his name on the ballot in both Florida and South Carolina, reportedly saying that West's team was working over the weekend there, formalizing the FEC and other things that they've got to do when you have a lot of corporate lawyers involved, adding we had overwhelming support to get him on the ballot. Uh, with Kramer also saying we had over 180 people out there today. But reportedly now, Kramer said he's out. I have nothing good or bad to say about Kanye. Everyone has their personal decision about why they make decisions. Running for president has to be one of the hardest things for someone to actually contemplate at that level. Any candidate running for president for the first time goes through these hiccups. Now here's the thing, Kanye West has not confirmed this himself as of recording this video. Since his tweet announcement slash claim that he was gonna be doing this, we've heard very little from him. I mean, other than him tweeting other unrelated things, also tweeting and then deleting a pro-life message. He did an interview where among other things, he came out as anti-vax. What I will say is interesting, if it is actually true that he is stopping, he is no longer actually pursuing this or saying that he's pursuing this. Is this news is being reported less than one week after Kanye West was actually included included in a national poll. Reportedly, the national poll happened on July 9th. It was conducted by Redfield and Wilton Strategy. And when Kanye wasn't included in the poll, you had Biden at 48%, Trump at 40%. But when Kanye was included, Biden was at 48% and Trump was at 39%. Now, obviously, that's just one poll. You have things like margins and errors. We can't, we can't just go, well, this is the truth. This is the 100% what would actually happen. But this poll does appear to push back against the idea that by Kanye West running, he would somehow just automatically siphon black votes away from Biden. Like we mentioned the last time we talked about that, it, for me, it felt very kind of disrespectful and short-sighted to believe that like black people don't understand the, the ramifications of this election. And once again, at least just according to this poll, it would have a neutral, if not just slightly negative reaction for Trump, right? So if it is true that Kanye West is backing off of this idea or he's pulling back and he doesn't kind of then reverse course and do it again, some might argue that it gives validity to the idea that Kanye West was running to try and help Trump. And that may be one of the reasons why he's backing off now. But that said, to add confusion to this situation, we're now also seeing reports that Kanye West filed the first form required by the FEC today. Form 1, Statement of Organization, declaring that the Kanye 2020 committee will serve as the principal campaign committee with West as its candidate, though the report also noting he's yet to file the more important Form 2, Statement of Candidacy, which shows he's raised or spent more than $5,000 in campaign activity and triggers candidacy status under federal campaign finance law. And you can check it on FEC.gov. Uh, it does appear to be there. So hey, maybe he's still actually gonna do it. Maybe he's not gonna do it. It's all confusion. I will unfortunately be keeping my eye on this situation, but I guess where I'll end this story is if one, it turns out that it is true that Kanye West is dropping out, let's please just have a moment of silence for all the Kanye West president memes. Great. And two, whether Kanye is out of the way or not, I am very excited to announce that I am running for President DeFranco 2020. Our slogan is, let's add to the chaos and confusion and I will be running as an independent as part of the uh, people aren't paying enough attention to me. Party. And as your new candidate for president, I say yes, we can be a distraction to the real issues that society is facing right now. Okay, enough of this bit, but I, I do wanna I wanna pass the question off to you. What are you what are your thoughts around all of this? Do you feel like Kanye's gonna come out soon and go like, no, I'm still in it? Or do you think this is all for attention for his new album and releases? Or is he really doing it? Or it's kind of this hot and cold thing. I don't, it's just a mess. I'd love to know your thoughts on it. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome brought to you by Real Paper. Not sure if you knew this, but every day over 27,000 trees are cut down to produce toilet paper. I know, I was pretty shocked by that as well. And so so are the good people over at Real Paper. And so to combat this issue, they found a more sustainable solution using bamboo. And what's great is there's absolutely no sacrifice in quality. It is still strong, soft, triple ply, so you won't even miss your old brand. And did I mention that they ship directly to your home for free? These guys absolutely saved us when COVID first hit. You know, TP, of course, was incredibly hard to find for a few weeks here in LA. But also, that's just one less thing to worry about now that I'm subscribed to Real Paper. By purchasing Real Paper, you're supporting their mission to provide access to clean toilets to those in need around the world. And to get you started today, Real Paper is offering $10 off your first subscription box when you use code DeFranco. So be sure to click that link down below or just head on over to realpaper.com slash DeFranco and use code DeFranco to do some good for 
the environment as well as yourself. And the first bit of awesome, and damn, it looks awesome, is we got a trailer for Project Power. It's the new Jamie Foxx, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Dominique Fishback movie. And essentially the premise is, what if there was a pill that gave you superpowers for five minutes? Also before taking the pill, you don't know what superpower you're gonna get. It looks really fascinating. Then we had the cast of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars 5 taking a friendship test. Then we had How to Drink giving us cursed cocktails. We had Whitney Cummings interviewing Eric Andre. And if you wanna see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all, links as always are in the description down below. And then let's talk about this news and controversy around Nick Cannon. You might've seen his name trending last night, this morning, and it all appears to be stemming back to anti-Semitic comments that he made on an episode of his podcast, Cannon's Class. The episode in question aired just a few weeks ago. It had Professor Griff on as a guest. Notably, Professor Griff was in public enemy until he exited the group back in 1989, following anti-Semitic remarks that he made in an interview, with reports saying that he told the Washington Times that Jews are wicked and we can prove this, adding that they are responsible for, quote, the majority of wickedness that goes on across the globe. And on this recent podcast, you had Nick Cannon not specifically referencing those exact words, but he actually asked him about the controversy, with some saying that Cannon was sort of applauding him for not apologizing at the time. And there we saw Professor Griff sort of continue to defend those comments. So in order for me to be anti-Semitic, I'd have to be anti-black man, anti-black woman, anti-black people, anti-Africa, anti-all of the people. Because the Semitic people are black people. Are black people. So, so y'all get that clarity. We're gonna say that again. Now, the Semitic people are black people. So as Professor Griff continued to talk about his remarks, his ideology behind them, Nick says that he was speaking the truth. He then references the Rothschilds, who, if you don't know, are a family that's been subject to anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And also he seemed to promote those theories after Professor Griff seemed to suggest that six main media companies are controlled by Jewish people. Who are so, they? When we when we speak of, because this is where it truly is, when we talk about those, <coughs> the, the, the six corporations when we talk when we go as deep as the Rothschild centralized banking those the the the, the 13 families uh, the bloodlines that control everything even outside of America. Nick also saying that black people are the true Hebrews. Throughout the podcast, Nick also brings up the controversial Nation of Islam leader, Minister Louis Farrakhan, who has long been known for making anti-Semitic comments. Right, I mean, according to the Anti-Defamation League, as recently as the 4th of July, he referred to Jewish people as Satan and an enemy of God. And Kenan calls Farrakhan honorable, praises him, says that people are silencing him, defends him against criticisms of anti-Semitism. And in one clip that's been going viral on Twitter, we saw Nick sort of speaking about the historical context of religion and saying so then these people who didn't have what we had and when i say we i speak of the mm -hmm. melanated people right they had to be savages they had to be barbaric and as far as who he's referencing there he later adds whether it's jewish people white people europeans the illuminati mm -hmm. They were doing that as survival tactics. Right, Nick Cannon said a bunch of other stuff as well. We're mainly focusing on the anti-Semitism as it relates to another part that we're gonna touch on in a minute. You know, you also had a lot of people pointing out him suggesting that people without melanin were lesser or deficient, closer to animals. Saying things like they're acting out of fear, they're acting out of low self-esteem, they're acting out of a deficiency. Saying so therefore the only way they can act is evil. They have to rob, steal, rape, kill in order to survive. And so following the podcast and these clips going viral, you had a lot of people taking offense, being outraged, believing much of what they saw was rooted in anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. With the American and Jewish committee calling them abhorrent and unacceptable, adding his message of hate has no place in our society and should be condemned by all people of good conscience. Though it is important to note here, there are a lot of people defending him, thinking people are just way too eager to cancel a black man. You know, on Monday, as backlash was starting to come in from all of this, Nick took to Facebook to say, anyone who knows me knows that I have no hate in my heart nor malice intentions. I do not condone hate speech nor the spread of hateful rhetoric. The black and Jewish communities have both faced enormous hatred, oppression, persecution, and prejudice for thousands of years and in many ways have and will continue to work together to overcome these obstacles. I am an advocate for people's voices to be heard openly, fairly, and candidly. In today's conversation about anti-racism and social justice, I think we all, including myself, must continue educating one another and embrace uncomfortable conversations. It's the only way we all get better. And also adding that he is holding himself accountable. Then we ended up getting the big news last night that Viacom CBS, which had a relationship with Nick for decades, said that they are dropping ties with him. Saying in a statement yesterday, Viacom CBS condemns bigotry of any kind and we categorically denounce all forms of anti-Semitism. We have spoken with Nick Cannon about an episode of his podcast, Cannon's Class, on YouTube, which promoted hateful speech and spread anti-Semitic conspiracy theories. And adding, while we support ongoing education and dialogue in the fight against bigotry, we are deeply troubled that Nick has failed to acknowledge or apologize for perpetuating anti-Semitism, and we are terminating our relationship with him. We are committed to doing better in our response to incidents of anti-Semitism, racism, and bigotry. And that is just an absolutely massive move, because like I said, Nick's working relationship with this company goes 
all the way back to his Nickelodeon days. And so following this announcement this morning, we saw Nick Cannon respond. In a lengthy Facebook post, he condemned Viacom for cutting ties with him, saying that he was trying to create a moment of reconciliation, but that moment was, quote, stolen and hijacked to make an example of an outspoken black man. And adding, I will not be bullied, silenced, or continuously oppressed by any organization, group, or corporation. I am disappointed that Viacom does not understand or respect the power of the black community. Then going on to talk about his long history with the company from writing for Nickelodeon at just 17 to becoming the chairman of Teen Nick and then adding, I created a billion dollar brand that expanded across a multi-tiered empire that is still Viacom's biggest digital brand, touring business, talent discovery and incubation system, and successful restaurant franchise. Based on trust and empty promises, my ownership was swindled away from me. He also goes on to claim that Viacom has banned ads regarding George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And as far as his recent situation, he claimed that he actually got support from the Jewish community. And going on to say, I must apologize to my Jewish brothers and sisters for putting them in such a painful position, which was never my intention, but I know this whole situation has hurt many people and together we will make it right. With his post continuing, as for Viacom, who is now on the wrong side of history, I will continue to pray for you. I don't blame any individual, I blame the oppressive and racist infrastructure. And adding, if I have furthered the hate speech, I wholeheartedly apologize. With him then asking for full ownership of Wild and Out and uh, for an apology. But ultimately, with, with all of that said, that is where we are with this right now. You know, you have a lot of people looking at this situation going, okay, well, what happens next? Right, and that in part because Viacom CBS isn't the only one out there that has a relationship with Nick Cannon. You have a number of other people looking to networks like Fox that still have working ties with him. Also kind of on the other side of this regarding people who support him and what happens next. We saw the likes of Diddy this morning tweeting, Nick Cannon come home to Revolt TV, truly black owned. We got your back and love you and what you have done for the culture. We are for our people first, for us, by us, let's go. We also saw Dwayne Wade tweeting out support of Nick Cannon, but then later deleting it. But ultimately that is where we are with this story right now. It is still developing. We're still seeing fallout, more reactions. And so actually along those lines, I, I do want to pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts around this? Are you happy to see that Viacom CBS cut ties with Nick Cannon? Do you agree with the people that are outraged by him? Or are you kind of in line with Diddy? You support Nick Cannon? Why, why not? Any and all thoughts, of course, I'd love to hear from you in those comments down below. And then let's talk about the situation around the coronavirus, the CDC, and the Trump administration. Right, in general, this story is about how data is collected. In the past, that data was collected by the Centers for Disease Control. But now the Trump administration has ordered that starting today, hospitals are to bypass the CDC and instead send their information about COVID-19 to a central database controlled by the Department of Health and Human Services. Right, and this is a move that was shocking to health experts. You know, it's kind of intuitive that information about an ongoing pandemic would go to the Centers for Disease Control. But the supposed issue that this was solving is it's not just the CDC that needs the info, but also a ton of other agencies as well. So the argument behind this move is that by having all this information in one place that other agencies then access, it will streamline the process, right? Because it's not just the CDC that would use the info, but also groups like the Coronavirus Task Force. With the argument being that by having it all in one spot, it'll allow them to better handle the pandemic and better allocate scarce resources. Things like ventilators, PPE, remdesivir, which is the first drug shown to be effective against the virus. And as far as how this whole plan even started, according to a July 10th memo that laid out today's new rules. Back in late March, Vice President Pence sent a letter to hospitals across the United States asking them to send daily reports about the pandemic. And since then, a ton of agencies have asked for similar information, with the government claiming that hospitals complained that so many groups were asking for information that it was distracting administrators from actual hospital duties. Some even saying that they had to hire extra full-time employees just to handle all the requests for data. So reportedly, Dr. Deborah Burks, the White House Coronavirus Response Coordinator, sets up a call with hospital administrators and groups that represent hospitals to come up with a new plan, which brings us full circle back to today and the new reporting rules. Right, so at face value, that might not sound too bad. You know, you might be asking, what's the catch? Why is this even a big deal? Well, here are the basic arguments against taking that information away from the CDC. The largest complaint is that it's moving information away from experts who specialize in disease management and control. Moving the information away from the experts has led to accusations that the administration is politicizing the science, which is why among other things, we saw an open letter from the past heads of the CDC from both Democrat and Republican administrations saying such. Also more recently in response to all of this, we saw Dr. Nicole Lurie, former Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response under Obama say, centralizing control of all data under the umbrella of an inherently political apparatus is dangerous and breeds distrust, adding it appears to cut off the ability of agencies like CDC to do its basic job, which leads to the next possible issue that the information won't be made available. Like Dr. Lurie stated, there are fears that the CDC will be blocked from the information. Also, beside the CDC, that information is used by a ton of people outside of government. And here's what Jen Cates, Director of Global Health and HIV Policy at the Kaiser Family Foundation had to say about it. Historically, CDC has been the place where public health data has been sent, and this raises questions 
discussions about not just access for researchers, but access for reporters, access for the public to try to better understand what is happening with the outbreak. And continuing, how will the data be protected? Will there be transparency? Will there be access? And what is the role of the CDC in understanding the data? Right, because obviously the public not having access to this data is a serious concern. This is a move coming from an administration and a president who constantly complains that we're testing too much. The numbers make him look bad. Now that said, regarding those that support this decision as far as what reasons they have, there's an argument that's been made that the CDC system that's called the National Healthcare Safety Network, that it's known for being cumbersome, slow, the guidelines for what data and how to submit it constantly change. This leading to hospital administrators being frustrated about needing to report the data over and over again to a ton of different agencies and shifting guidelines within each agency. And the new system, which is managed by Teletracking, which is a health data firm in Pittsburgh, is supposed to remove some of these redundancies, partly by using one standardized submission form. Also, if you have hospitals reporting to their state and that state then sends the information to the HHS, that hospital can get a waiver and skip sending it to the HHS themselves. With there also being hopes that this system will be faster than what the CDC currently uses. With Health and Human Services spokesperson Michael R. Caputo saying, today the CDC still has at least a weak lag in reporting hospital data. America requires it in real time. Now, th there is a possible issue with this whole explanation. Both systems use push data, meaning that they both require hospital states and agencies to actually input the data themselves and send it to the HHS. However, uh, that July 10th memo does state that there are plans to automate the process, something that the CDC has struggled to do for years. Caputo also trying to calm fears that the information was going to be locked away from the CDC and the public saying, the new faster and complete data system is what our nation needs to defeat the coronavirus and the CDC and operating division of HHS will certainly participate in this streamlined all of government response. They will simply no longer control it. With them also going on to specifically say that the data would be available to the public. Which on that note, we've also seen Dr. Burks giving assurances to hospital administrators back when this whole system was being set up that the info would be public. And those assurances were at least bought by some of the doctors on the call, including the likes of Dr. Janice Orlowski, who told the New York Times, we are comfortable with a switch as long as they continue to work with us, as long as they continue to make the information public, and as long as we're able to continue to advise them and look at the data. With the doctor adding that she believes that the switch is a sincere effort to streamline and improve data collection. But as of right now, there's no data coming at all. We also have the New York Times reporting that the Health and Human Services database that will receive new information is not open to the public, which could affect the work of scores of researchers, modelers, and health officials who rely on CDC data to make projections and crucial decisions. That's a key distinction, right? The difference between the information being made public down the line and having direct access to the database itself, right? With direct access, researchers wouldn't need to worry about any of the numbers being messed with. But as of right now, with the system just having launched this morning, there's no data coming out at all, not even on the CDC's page. And you know, the HHS has complained that the CDC took at least a week to report information. So since today is the first day of this new system, we'll actually have to wait to see if the HHS can actually go any faster. Now, that said, understand there are still criticisms that putting the information in the hands of political appointees is dangerous. You had Representative Donna Shalala of Florida, who previously served as health secretary saying, only the CDC has the expertise to collect data. I think any move to take responsibility away from the people who have the expertise is politicizing. But ultimately, that is where we are with the story as of right now. We're obviously gonna keep our eyes on it. But with that said, I do wanna pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts here? With the Trump administration doing this, does it make you concerned about the numbers or do you believe them? This is really about just the, the whole system getting better. Why, why not? Any and all thoughts you have here, I'd love to see in those comments down below. And that is where I'm going to end today's show. As always, to the three of you still here, thank you for being a part of this. Whether you're just a part of the community that's watching or maybe you're liking, sharing the video, being a part of the conversation down below. I appreciate you. Also, if you're new here, you wanna join the family, hit that subscribe button, definitely tap that bell so you turn on notifications so you get updates when I know what was I gonna say? Uh, when I upload videos, don't mind me, my mind is slowly turning into jelly. But as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow. I hope you liked the video. Subscribe if you like it.